Welcome to Body Mind Healing. I'm Diana Lindsay. In our last unit, The Starting Point, we looked at the role that hope can play following a diagnosis. In this unit, Taking Charge, we put hope into action. Over the last decades, the changing models of the doctor-patient relationship have put the patient increasingly in charge of our own healing. But how prepared are we to lead a healthcare team if we focus outward and lead our own selves if we focus inward? This is my grandmother. She taught me to sew, a skill I rarely use. She also taught me to love music and dance and the theater, an appreciation that may have saved my life. We both loved our husbands dearly, and we have something else in common. Although non-smokers, we both were diagnosed with lung cancer. In 1959, this information was kept from her by both her doctor and her husband, who died of a heart attack two months before she did. In 2006, I was not only told I had cancer, I was expected to participate in the decision-making process around my care. A revolution in patient-doctor relationship had occurred between our two illnesses. Why was this a good thing? I didn't have a medical degree. How was I going to make a better decision than my doctor could? My grandmother's story falls in the middle of an evolving model of the doctor-patient relationship. She was in the modern period, and let's look at it from the point of view of the doctor. In the traditional period, Prior to the dramatic changes in med medical practice in the 20th century, there was a long period in which the, the nature of this relationship was fairly stable. Medicine had comparatively weak diagnostic powers and was limited in its effectiveness. Many courses of treatment were ineffective, unreliable, and many ailments were untreatable. In the modern period, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a dramatic increase in medicine's diagnostic power. This is what we learned in the last unit. Clinical examinations became standard practice, and physicians therefore started to enjoy a very high level of prestige. Now, interestingly, in this postmodern period, in the last part of the last century and into this one, the therapeutic effectiveness of medicine has increased dramatically, again as we saw in the last unit. But ironically, medicine itself has been demystified. Doctors call this the effect of Dr. Google. And with the increasing impersonalization of medicine caused by our healthcare system, the prestige of the doctor has actually decreased just at the moment when they're doing us the most good. So if we summed up then the revolution in the doctor-patient relationship, in the traditional model, the doctor took his best guess, the patient took their best guess, and everybody did all that they could. In the modern, we see a real shift towards the doctor knows best. There is this magic science that a patient does not have access to. The doctor's job then was to allow patients to look behind the veil enough to know what he was suggesting, but mostly with the goal of just getting the patient to comply with whatever it was. But all that started to change in the 1980s. This change was built on two ideas that emerged that patients should have sovereignty over their bodies, and that they needed to be given the autonomy to choose for themselves. Coincidentally or not, malpractice suits in the U.S. were on the rise from the 1960s on. Now, this has resulted in new training in medical schools covering a range of models, but the essence of the change is that patients are shifting from passive to active roles, with doctors as both repositories of information and collaborators in coming to mutual decisions over the course of care. You might want to pause this video to see where you would place your own relationship with your doctor. It turns out that the patient active movement wasn't just about a philosophy of patient rights, nor malpractice it yielded better health, health outcomes, as shown in research from 1987 that was replicated again in 1996. Those who have an active coping, coping style with uh, the illness chronic pain experience less pain, less depression, less functional impairment, and had a higher sense of self-efficacy than those who had a passive coping style. 
In the 1980s, we also saw the rise of something called integrative medicine that we talked about in the very first unit. This too was concerned about the partnership between the patient and the practitioner, but it, w- it wanted to extend the relationship to include both conventional and alternative methods. A big difference is that this movement didn't just address the relationship, nor the fact that the patient had an active role in it, but also that the patient was a whole person. So all factors that influence health, wellness, and disease, including mind, body, and spirit, and community, should be considered. The thrust in in integrative medicine is to give you, the patient, the right to be empowered as the responsible central actor in your own healing. Of course, this can be a double-edged sword if we either don't know how or don't want to take this role. Or as Lao Tzu put it, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you're heading. So let's take a moment in our toolkits before going on to just think about your own relationships with your doctors or any other healthcare providers. Do you have an active or a passive coping style in both those relationships and in other areas of life? And we'll see you back in Unit 3.2.